Hello, I'm Holly Tanner with the Herman and Wallace Pelvic Rehab Institute, and I'm here with faculty member Ramona Horton to talk about her course series. Um, Ramona, first, will you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and your background? Okay, um, thanks, Holly. It's really fun to do this and get an opportunity to explain exactly what it is that I do. So my introduction to physical therapy was knee surgery at 16, but my introduction to the professional world is I was a physical therapist in the Army. I went through the Army Baylor program, which gave me a master's degree in 15 months and quite a rude awakening to um, learning how to think for yourself. That was the whole emphasis of the military program. And since then, lived a few different places, got out of the military and settled in Southern Oregon. So I'm just one state down from you in a small valley here. And 2007, went up to Seattle and um, had <laughs> uh, added just a course and Kathy Wallace was there. We started chatting a little bit. And after about an hour of talking, she's like, I want you to teach a course for me. <laughs> and that's sort of how it all started. And what was that first course? Okay, so the very first course that I taught for Kathy and Holly was a visceral mobilization for the urinary system. So when, so going back to how I got into visceral work, goes back to <clears throat> my time in the military. I had a very large baby, kind of, as Elaine Miller says, wrecked my undercarriage. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I had horrible, I had no bladder control whatsoever mm -hmm. and in the hospital. And the physician that was the, that was the head of the OB department in a military hospital patted me on the shoulder and said, that's okay, just do a thousand kegels a day. And when you're 40 and wants your hysterectomy, we'll fix your bladder then. And believe wow. me, I can quote it because those words were cemented in my brain. Mm -hmm. At this point, I'm a functioning orthopedic, primarily orthopedic therapist. And I was shocked and somewhat incensed. And that's what got me in interested in the field of pelvic health. And I took my first pelvic health course back in 1993, I believe, 92 or 93. It's only the second course that Kathy and Holly ever taught together. And the point was that I was interested in trying to understand how do we treat bowel and bladder dysfunction without treating the bowel and bladder. So that was the impetus to get me to study visceral work. And so I took this bazillion different visceral courses, went to France, studied with Dr. Burrell. And that's that was sort of the background. And then Kathy and I were at this course together and she, we started talking. So the first thing that we developed was a two course series, urinary system and reproductive system. And then out of that two course series, my standing line is, of course, like Kevin Costner in the Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. And when we started in pelvic health, it was primarily just some prenatal postpartum stuff, leaky bladders. And our field has been the most amazing growth experience within the field of physical therapy. Pelvic health is the number one growth area. And now we're seeing patients with complex bowel disorders mm -hmm. and patients with ostomies and patients with IBS and IBD and so many other dysfunctions. And so that necessitated the development of the GI course. So it ended up as a three course, but it's not a series. The only prerequisite is for the reproductive course. And the reproductive course does require, initially you had to have the urinary system. I'm going to the point now where if you have the GI system, you can do reproductive. It's a little tough because there's add-ons. But if you've made it through one course and you feel comfortable in your skill set, generally people can catch on pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. But there's the reproductive course has to have you have to have a background to do it. You know, how much do you feel your experiences in the military informs how you approach this work? And second, you're also in a really cool environment in which you can walk down the hall and interface with physicians and surgeons and uh, because you work in a hospital system. Mm -hmm. And so how much do you find that those two pieces are really important for how you've been able to develop your work and how you can access care with your patients? I, the military had a huge impact on me because the whole point in the military was mission first. What's the goal? Get the job done and figure out how to get the job done as expeditiously as possible. And that has had a huge influence on my entire clinical practice. And so I'm one that just has a fit if I'm spinning my wheels, if I'm mired in minutia, makes me crazy. 
And so I bypass, I bypass stuff if it doesn't lead to the mission. What are the direct results? When people call me all the time, they'll start giving me all these explanations of this is going on with the patient, this and this and this and say, but stop, what's your goal? Is it incontinence? What, what is their presenting complaint that they want to get better? And all the rest of the stuff, I don't, it's not important. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the military has had a huge impact on my whole process. And when I teach, I've taken a, a lot of, of courses that are three and four days long, and you have to take two and three of them, and I've condensed them down to two and a half days, the entire GI system in two and a half days, because I've taken out the minutia. Mm -hmm. And then the hospital system that you work within. Well, the healthcare system I'm in, we actually don't have, I don't have physicians that are working within the system, but that's just starting. So we are in a small valley and our system has slowly bought up small failing regional hospitals. And we now have three hospitals and we're just getting our first female urologist, which I was thrilled with. And we we're starting to collaborate now, but I've been there for 27 years and this is just starting. In terms of the, the reproductive urinary and GI courses that you have, uh, what can folks expect to learn at these courses? And you know, what kind of patients might they find they now have more tools to approach these patients with? Sure. Well, the entire premise, excuse me. Okay. The entire premise of visceral work is the understanding that the attachment of the visceral structures, the visceral fascia, attaches to the somatic frame. When we look at, at the somatic frame, we all are very familiar with the idea of the canister. Functional anatomical construct where we have the respiratory diaphragm at the top and the pelvic diaphragm at the bottom. The side walls are the abdominal, primarily abdominal dorsal lumbar fascia with the multifidine. And then that anatomical construct is the center of our stabilization platform. Well, maybe you could say the pelvic floor is the platform of it, but that, that, that core, that canister. Well, attaching to the core and the canister on the outside is all of our, our musculature that we're always working on as physical therapists. But it also has attachments on the inside. The premise of the visceral work is that we are not hollow. And that these structures and these attachments have an influence on the function of the somatic frame. That one cannot ignore the fact that you have a three pound liver sitting underneath your diaphragm on the right side, that you have a solid uterus in your pelvis with spokes in the endopelvic fascia that go out and attach to the pelvic sidewalls and the sacrum, that the endopelvic fascia attaches along the sacrum all the way down to the level of the coccyx. And, it ha and that if, the, depending on the positioning of the uterus, can set up an asymmetry. When there's an asymmetry in the body, that that creates a pull on the musculature, and the musculature, therefore, would be functioning suboptimally. Mm -hmm. That's kind of it in a nutshell for all three courses. That's great. And what advice do you have for participants when they're coming into this work? And perhaps they would describe themselves as very exercise-based or not having a lot of skills in palpation or the visceral anatomy. What are some what are some pearls that you give to folks when they come into the work or even once they've taken the work, uh, the classwork, how to keep developing those skills? I have a number of silly sayings. I mean, I say a lot of silly things so people remember them. The one is always, if if the structure is tight, it's tight for a reason. And it's tight because the brain is keeping it that way. It's too often people are going, oh, the hamstring is tight. Therefore, we have to do something to the hamstring. And my answer is no, if the hamstring's tight, the hamstring's tight because the brain is keeping it tight. What's driving that? Well, or let's say pelvic floor in, since we're talking about the visceral course, or the abdominal wall. So what's the driver? And that's a common term that people use all the time, but I want you to think about it from a visceral perspective, because what do you think the brain likes more? The kidneys or the psoas, <laughs> or the kidneys or the abdominal wall? Well, without kidney function, you die in three days. So I think the brain's protecting the kidneys, and I think the brain is using the psoas as the guard. Mm -hmm. So let's stop shoving our fingers through people's abdomen to release their psoas, drives me insane. And let's start thinking about what the brain's protecting. 
Mm -hmm. And again, that's the whole premise is the brain likes the structures on the inside of the body. They keep us alive. And maybe that if the muscle is tight, the brain's driving that. And your job is to ask yourself what? So my next silly saying is who lives in the neighborhood and where do the relatives live? Who lives in the neighborhood means what's the regional anatomy in the area? Okay, so let's talk about a woman has bladder urgency frequency. And she had a history of a really significant fall 10 years ago, motor vehicle accident, something. And she has right hip pain and bladder urgency frequency. Well, my first thought is we need to look at the liver and the kidney on the right side. And, and you would think, well, why? Well, A, they had a fall. But B, this right hip and groin pain is the distribution of the lumbar plexus. And the lumbar plexus lives in the neighborhood right behind the kidney. If, if I didn't say it is, but if the brain might be protecting the kidney, then we can see that it would be tightening up that tissue, which could potentially cause an upregulation in the region of the lumbar plexus. The lumbar plexus distribution would be going down to the right hip and groin region, but also what's in the lumbar plexus, but the hypogastric. So the hypogastric nerves are all found in the lumbar plexus and that contributes to bladder urgency frequency. So that's, that's just an example of sort of the, the way I am trying to teach people to think mm -hmm. is ask yourself who lives in the neighborhood and where do the relatives live? The relatives are what we're talking about, the innervation of the hypogastrics. Or maybe the woman has had a C-section, now she has a lot of bladder urgency frequency. Well, the iliac hypogastric nerve could be getting irritated by the C-section scar because just because of it's where it's living. <laughs> Puppies in the background. And, and so then we might get bladder urgency frequency from that. So, so my final, the final thing I really talk about is know your anatomy like the back of your hand. But for those people that haven't studied visceral anatomy extensively, that's okay. You can learn it. We send out a list of the visceral structures for each course that you need to become familiar with mm -hmm. and giving them that opportunity to learn the anatomy. And then my goal is to just get right to the nitty gritty and say, you know, these are the typical patterns that you might experience. And here's, here's who lives in the neighborhood. And we talk about the regional anatomy and what's above it, below it on either side. And then let's talk about the innervation and distribution that you might see if they develop a viscerosomatic response, which is convergence occurring at the dorsal horn, or you might see a somatovisceral response. Mm -hmm. So you can see any number of these types of, of referred pain patterns and learning how to recognize that. So th that's the whole premise is I, I want to teach people how to think. I don't want to teach them 87 techniques. I want to teach them how to think for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that all goes back to my time in the military. Well, and is it sometimes difficult to separate the different courses because so much of it is really integrated. And again, there's just so much information to share. Oh, right. People will say things like, well, I want to do pelvic pain. Which course should I take? It's like, mm -hmm. it's not, I had to do it by region because it just was a much logical way. So in the GI course, you'll learn things that will affect, have an effect on the bladder. In the urinary course, we have huge impacts because we do the kidneys in the urinary course, and that's huge impacts and overlay for myofascial orthopedic issues. Yeah. Uh, but there's huge impacts on myofascial orthopedic issues and pain patients with the GI course, because that's where we learn all the diaphragmatic structures. And for pain patients, you know, if, they're, if that diaphragm isn't expanding, your pelvic diaphragm is not going to expand. Sure. And, and we, you know, if you don't breathe properly, then you're just simply not, you're not going to have that that excursion that we're looking for and you can teach people breathing exercises till the cows come home but if the brain is driving a protection mechanism in the diaphragm structures liver primarily and spleen the solid structures if the liver is driving a protection mechanism you are not going to override that with conscious breathing exercises mm -hmm. but you can override it when you utilize manual therapy techniques having a conversation with the brain Mm -hmm. Well, I know everyone is so excited about your courses and all the feedback is always very positive, including people saying they were able to put the work right into, right into play on, on the first day after they take your courses. 
That is one of my goals. That has always been one of the goals is to be able to walk in day one and implement the techniques and to implement the theory and implement the techniques immediately in your clinical practice. Well, thank you so much, Ramona, for sharing your thoughts. Thank you, Holly. It's been a pleasure.